Okay, so it's nine o'clock now, and um, I'm, yeah, I'm really uh, excited and a little bit nervous to do this. It's the first time I've done a, a live reading on Instagram, so I'm not quite as familiar with all the buttons and the technology, so please excuse me for, um, um, yeah, being a novice, but I wanted to do this um, uh, when I was asked to to do a bedtime story to by the architecture foundation um i jumped at the chance even though i'm on holiday and have been saying no to lots and lots of things i'm actually down in devon and we've had the most glorious sunshine we've had the benefit of the heat wave except for the last half hour when the skies have opened and we've had a massive summer thunderstorm and i'm hoping that it will clear up and that we will have um, a clear sky because today is the annual Pleiades uh, meteor um, shower which is the usually eight, uh, August the 12th 13th or 14th around those dates is when the earth is flying through the remains of a broken up comet or meteor or something and um, the result for us is that if the night is clear in the UK you see lots and lots of shooting stars so it's something to um, to try and um, do after this podcast is over. Um, I wanted to say a few words about me. I'm Fahana Yamin. I um, came to this country when I was about nine from Pakistan. I um, worked very hard, you know, the typical um, Asian, Pakistani, uh, working class ethic to to do well in education and to try and get a a secure job and to do good and be of service to your community and to make your parents proud. So that's my little uh, history and what I've been trying to do for the last uh, 30, 35 years. I qualified as a lawyer and uh, at a time when things were really exciting and lots and lots of environmental legislation uh, in the UK, in the EU, in internationally was being written um, and it was a great time to to feel that you know law um, could make a great impact on trying to to um, to protect our planet and to remember how beautiful it was and to try and you know stop the degradation which we knew about even then in the 90s when I qualified. Um, I'm a little bit older now. You know, hair has gone completely grey. We have now thousands of laws. Uh, at least three t treaties that I myself have helped negotiate, including the Paris Agreement, the Kyoto Protocol, and um, the, the Climate Convention. I've been to hundreds of UN summits, and we haven't quite um, grasped, I think, how much structural change was needed and how we needed to create an alliance of people from all backgrounds, from all parts of the world, from... Um, the north, the south, the east, the west, um, and to bring the wisdom of all ages uh, together. So the th reading that I'm going to read out today is uh, a, a, a really important uh, piece of writing um, by Audre Lord, who is a who was a black uh, lesbian American feminist, um, and she wrote this piece in 1979. It was actually a a written speech that she gave, a talk that she gave at uh, a conference in New York in September 1979, and it's called The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House. And I thought it was apt to uh, focus on what kind of tools and buildings and what kind of future uh, we're really uh, envisaging, uh, especially as I'm talking to an audience mainly, I think, of architects, designers, and uh, those in that profession. So here goes. Um, I'm not quite sure how long it will be exactly. And um, the reason, as I said, why I've chosen this piece is we've now finally, I think, understood much more clearly that, you know, dealing with climate change, with the biodiversity crisis, with environmental degradation cannot be done in isolation from the social and economic system. We cannot do it in isolation just by t tinkering at the edges. It's not just a little bit of technological kit or some brand new innovation that's going to solve the problem. This is fundamentally a planetary crisis and we need 
everyone to be present and everyone to think and do something differently and everyone to reconceive and imagine a very different world. And I think we didn't really grasp that. I certainly didn't grasp the scale of what we needed when I qualified as an environmental lawyer. I thought very much we could rely on existing tools. Um, and this piece, The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House, really insightfully makes the case that if we're to build the kind of society uh, and the kind of coalition of people who will really uh, change the world in the fundamental way that's needed to achieve social ecological justice, then we need to bring everyone to, to, to bear uh, and to listen and to hear and to put diversity and radical inclusion of everyone at the center of our politics, not at, um, as an afterthought. So here goes. Okay, I'm gonna read it exactly as, as it was written. So uh, it sort of reads in the first person as if I'm reading it uh, as her, um, which gives me, you know, I feel very humbled by that because she's a, a great author and a great inspirational activist and thought leader who's been rediscovered in the last uh, decade or so. So, I agreed to take part in a New York University Institute for the Humanities conference a year ago with the understanding that I would be commenting upon papers dealing with the role of difference within the lives of American women, difference of race, sexuality, class and age. The absence of these considerations weakens any feminist discussion of the personal and the political. It is a particular academic arrogance to assume any discussion of feminist theory without examining our many differences and without a significant input from poor women, black and third world women and lesbians. And yet I stand here as a black lesbian feminist, having been invited to comment within the only panel at this conference where the input of black feminists and lesbians is represented. What this says about the vision of this conference is sad in a country where racism, sexism, and homophobia are inseparable. To read this program is to assume that lesbian and black women have nothing to say about existentialism, the erotic, women's culture and silence, developing feminist theory or heterosexuality and power, and what it does mean in personal and political terms when even the two black women who did present here were literally found at the last hour. What does it mean when the tools of a racist patriarchy are used to examine the fruit of that very same patriarchy? It means that only the most narrow perimeters of change are possible and allowable. The absence of any consideration of lesbian consciousness or the consciousness of third world women leaves a serious gap within this conference and within the papers presented here. For example, in a paper on material relationships between women, I was conscious of an either or model of nurturing, which totally dismissed my knowledge as a black lesbian. In this paper, there was no examination of mutuality between women, no systems of shared support, no interdependence as exists between lesbian and women identified women. Yet is it only in the patriarchal model of nurturance that women who attempt to emancipate themselves pay perhaps too high a price for results, as this paper states. For women, the need and desire to nurture each other is not pathological, but redemptive. And it is within that knowledge that our real power is rediscovered. It is this real connection, which is so feared by a patriarchal world. Only within a patriarchal structure is maternity the only social power open to women. Interdependency between women is the way to a freedom which allows the I to be, not in order to be used, but in order to be creative. This is a difference between the passive be and the active being. Advocating the mere tolerance of difference between women is the grossest reformism. It is a total denial of the creative function of difference in our lives. Difference must, not, must be not merely tolerated, but seen as a fund of necessary polarities between which our creativity can spark like a dialectic. Only then does the necessity for interdependency become unthreatening. Only within that interdependency of different strengths, acknowledged and equal, can the power to seek new ways of being in the world generate, as well as the courage and sustenance to act where there are no charters. Within the interdependence of mutual, non-dominant differences, 
lies that security which enables us to descend into the chaos of knowledge and return with the true visions of our future, along with the concomitant power to affect those changes which can bring that future into being. Difference is the raw and powerful connection from which our personal power is forged. As women, we have been taught either to ignore our differences or to view them as causes of separation and suspicion rather than as forces for change. Without community, there is no liberation. Only the most vulnerable and temporary armistice between the individual and her oppression. But community must not mean a shedding of our differences, nor the pathetic pretense that these differences do not exist. Those of us who stand outside the circle of this society of acceptable women, those of us who have been forged in the crucible of difference, those of us who are poor, who are lesbians, who are black, who are older, know that survival is not an academic skill. It is a learning how to stand alone, unpopular and sometimes reviled, and how to make common cause with those others identified as outside the structures in order to define and seek a world in which we can all flourish. It is learning how to take our differences and make them strengths. For the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him as his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And this fact is only threatening to those women who still define the master's house as their only true source of support. Poor women and women of colour know there is a difference between the daily manifestations of marital slavery and prostitution because it is our daughters who line 42nd Street. If white American feminist theory need not deal with the differences between us and the resulting differences in our oppressions, then how do you deal with the fact that women who clean your houses and tend your children while you attend conferences on feminist theory are, for the most part, poor women and women of colour? What is the theory behind racist feminism? In a world of possibility for us all, our personal visions help lay the groundwork for political action. The failure of academic feminists to recognize difference as a crucial strength is a failure to reach beyond the first patriarchal lesson. In our world, divide and conquer must become define and empower. Why weren't other women of color found to participate in this conference? Why were two phone calls to, to me considered a consultation? Am I the only possible source, of possible source of names of black and important feminists? Although the black feminist, uh, sorry, and although the black panelist papers ends on an important and powerful connection of love between women, what about interracial cooperation between feminists who don't love each other? In an academic feminist circles, the answer to these questions is often, we didn't know who to ask. But that is the same evasion of responsibility, the same cop-out that keeps black women's art out of women's exhibition, black women's work out of most feminist publications, except for the occasional special third world women's issue, and black women's text off your reading lists. And as Adrienne Rich points out in a recent talk, White feminists have educated themselves about such an enormous amount over the past 10 years. How come you also haven't educated yourselves about black, black women and the differences between us, white and black, when it is key to our survival as a movement? Women of today are still being called upon to stretch across the gap of male ignorance and to educate men as to our existence and our needs. This is an old and primary tool of all oppressors to keep the oppressors preoccupied with the master's concerns. Now we hear that it is the task of women of color to educate white women in the face of tremendous resistance as to our existence, our differences, our relative roles in our joint survival. This is a diversion of energies and a tragic repetition of racist patriarchal thought. Simone de Beauvoir once said, it is in the knowledge of the genuine conditions of our lives that we must draw our strengths to live and for our reasons for acting. Racism and homophobia are real conditions of all our lives in this place and time. I urge each one of us here 
to draw down into that deep place of knowledge inside herself and touch that terror and loathing of any difference that lives there. Sees whose face it wears. Then the personal as the political can begin to illuminate all our choices. So that's the end of that piece. Um, and I guess I have a little bit more time and I was supposed to choose a longer or a different piece. Um, um, but I wondered if I can just take uh, a few minutes to, to explain a little bit why that piece is so powerful for me right now. I feel we're all searching for ways, especially many people after Black Lives Matter. I've had so many people write to me uh, contact me, talk to me um, about different experiences and different facets of what it means for me as a person of colour. As one of the few persons of colour in the environment movement, and this uh, essay by uh, Audrey Lord really helped um, nail some of my own feelings of both relief that I'm being asked, but also frustration as well that um, the asking has taken so long and that it often requires a lot more work and a lot more emotional labor from me to explain um, my feelings myself, to explain how racism operates in the environment movement, in the climate movement. And I think it's one of the reasons why I feel very strongly we have not achieved some of the fundamental goals that we have um, set out for ourselves, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, because we have narrowed our agenda and not truly valued the perspectives of uh, working people, of indigenous people, of the entire developing world, uh, which is referred in Audrey Lord's essay as the third world, but now very much has caught up. Um, and outnumbers all of the, uh, the, the, the traditional uh, developed world, essentially Europe and North America and Australia, the richer countries who historically were considered the first world. So um, I feel very much in a period of reflection and that sometimes going back to what our uh, theorists, our mentors, our guides, those who are at the forefront uh, uh, of, of uh, activism as well as theory is a source of inspiration for me and I wanted to very much share that with you and I often use that quote, the master's tools will never uh, dismantle the master's house in many of the lectures and talks that I give uh, to, to challenge people to go beyond the, the um, reformist, the incremental, the let's fix the system as it is and make it a little bit better because the system is failing on such a colossal scale for so many people. And COVID-19, coronavirus in the last six months all over the world is just the tip of the iceberg in showing us how we're not really all in this together. The coronavirus has impacted, the same virus has impacted our lives so differently. It is not the case that we're all equally vulnerable to the virus itself or to the after shocks of economic and social recession. So I feel the, the need for us to, to really understand and move forward um, by placing difference and its celebration, its acceptance is a source of experience is uh, more than ever something that we all need to work very, very hard to incorporate um, and, and going back and recognizing that uh, we've been trying to do that and people have been asking to do that for decades, 1979, as I said, this essay was, um, this, this uh, speech was given, um, is something that I think that is uh, very important to recognize so that we have, um, we have, we can draw on that as a strength.